On today's Locked on Jayhawks, the season is over. Kansas gets blown out in the second round. Rinse, repeat. You are Locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. Give me a follow at D Johnson Radio on Twitter. You can find our show here with Locked on Jayhawks anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. Thanks for making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day. Thank you to every day or tuning in to each and every episode. We'll have continued content coming throughout the shows and the uh, more nationwide network about what's going on with the bracket. But on today's edition of Locked on Jayhawks, the season is over for KU. They get blown out in the second round of the NCAA tournament for there, I guess it would be their third time in their last four tournament losses, or I guess third time in the last six seasons, whatever that would end up being. And uh, now a lot of questions for KU going into the offseason. We'll get to some of the questions here. We'll more so save that for a future episode, kind of breaking down the game uh, a little bit on this one for Kansas. First, this episode of the show is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan. Nissan Pathfinder or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. Kansas gets smashed 89 to 68 to Gonzaga. It was actually a great first half, not just for Kansas, but just generally like watching basketball. 44 43, very interesting back and forth. And then the second half was, I don't know, it's, it's hard when you specify like halves. Um, to be like, this was the worst half of the Bill Self era or something like that. I don't know. You go back to like the 2014, uh, 2015 season with the Champions Classic against Kentucky. Both halves were horrible. And like they've had some other really bad halves. But I don't know. On a national spotlight and everything, that certainly would go up there. One of the worst halves of basketball of the Bill Self era in the second half. And the first half was, it was fun to watch. It was back and forth and Kansas played well on the offensive end. But I think it kind of when you hear Bill Self, and we he, we haven't hear, heard him say this in like a decade, so I do think it gets overused now. But the old term that Bill Self used was like fool's gold with three point shooting in terms of like, oh, sometimes that masked some of your deficiency that, that we didn't really play well, but we just hit a bunch of threes and it carried us. I think nowadays three point shooting is certainly more I don't know, used and valuable that it's not used as much and everything. But that's kind of what that first half was. It was fool's gold. Kansas was hot from three. They were what seven of eleven from three point range in the first half. And that masked a lot of the deficiencies. They were making their their layups a little bit at a higher clip than they were in the second half. Uh, Kansas has not been a good offensive rebounding team this year. They came into this game in like the uh, around 300th in the country in offensive rebound rate. They were doing an excellent job getting offensive rebounds, getting extra possessions in the first half. Those things were not characteristic of who they were. And the defense was a problem in the first half. They couldn't defend pick and roll, especially over the back half of the first half. But they masked those deficiencies with the offense. Second half came around. The offense stopped clicking, whether it was, you know, the legs getting a little bit tired. You're playing the short turnaround game. You had one of the earlier games after having one of the last games the the previous night. You're playing an altitude. You have a thinner team. You had to really stress and play those starters throughout the rest of the game because you weren't able to, you know, keep the foot on the gas pedal against Samford. And so were you a little bit more tired in the second half? Did the legs go away? Did you start missing shots that maybe you would normally make? Or is that just uh, what this team has been this year where they haven't been consistent shooting the basketball and, you know, that you were bound to kind of have a come down from the first half? And so once that stuff started happening – and you stopped being this elite offensive rebounding team and making those shots, then it was going to be about, okay, in the second half, can you fix what you did defensively in the first half? Because it was clear they were exploiting a couple things. They were exploiting pick and roll. They were exploiting uh, exploiting ball screens. They were exploiting just attacking Hunter Dickinson. I mean, if you go back and watch the game, watch how many times they put Hunter Dickinson into a defensive action, just basically saying, hey, whoever guarding you we're gonna go at him grammy ek in the post we're going to you uh guard gets switched on him or we put him in a, in a ball screen where it's gonna put somebody else at a disadvantage we're gonna go at him and that was kind of over and over for kansas where i mean you end up gonzaga shooting 60 percent from the floor eight of 15 on threes 19 assists to 10 turnovers and they had 38 points in the paint you just constantly put kansas as a defense and hunter dickinson into a blender on the defensive side of the ball and it's not new that Kansas struggled with defending ball screens and defending that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, Kansas was still able to mask that to have like a top 15 defense on Ken Palm adjusted defensive efficiency coming in that like they did enough well that even with that one big struggle, they were okay. Well, Gonzaga just exploited you on like every possession. 
to do it. And there was nothing you could do to stop it. I was a little surprised KU didn't at least try a zone because yes, you could argue would it have helped. And, you know, I, I don't know. There, there's some questions you could have about how well does this player, that player fit into a zone if Kansas play, but like the counter to that is, well, nothing was really working. Why not try something? You know what I mean? Um, so I don't know. Uh, maybe it's a canary in a coal mine where it doesn't really matter, but still uh, really the only reason Kansas led in that first half was just kind of uncharacteristic offense. And so honestly for the game though, like I still look at some of the stats, Kansas did really bad on two point shots, which is not characteristic for them. Kansas did really bad on layups and dunks, which oddly enough, I mean, we had a lot of conversations this year that there were a lot of games where Kansas missed a, a bunch of layups. So that did kind of come back as a bug boo in this game. You only shot 39% from the floor, but if I would have said coming in, you were going to go nine of 22 from three, 41%. You were going to have 15 offensive rebounds. You were going to have 20 assists to just eight turnovers. You would have thought Kansas would have had a real chance to win this game. But again, the defense was so bad that you needed the offense to be elite all game long. And instead the offense was elite in the first half and basically average in the second half, even though they had that super cold spell at the beginning of the second half. I think it's super interesting because KU's defense did come in top 15 and Ken Palm adjusted deficiency or defensive efficiency. Uh, it felt like a deficiency in this game. Felt like Gonzaga was playing five on four. But, uh, you know, we knew this team's flaws all year long. And even coming into this tournament where you didn't know how far they were going to go, there had already been some chatter and talk about what are you going to try to do in the off season? What do you want to try to add in the off season? And, you know, for me specifically, like my initial checklist of what I'm looking for Kansas to add in the off season before this game was like basically shot creation and shot making. So three point shooting and guys who can get their own shot off of the bounce. I think that is so important in an NCAA tournament setting, but it's also much more pleasing to watch from just like a, you know, a fan perspective or covering there or whatever it is like it is, it, but you know, you look at the teams who go far, you look at uh, the best Kansas teams like that have gone far in the tournament. They've had multiple guys who can get a shot at once on the court. Right. Um, so like you look at the 2022 team for Kansas. Well, you had Remy Martin could get a shot whenever he wanted. You had two pros and Christian Brown and Ochag Bashi. David McCormick could get a shot in the like post-up situation when he wanted to, even though it was inconsistent, he could do that. Right. That you had a bunch of guys you could do that. Well, in this year's team, you didn't have really as many, especially with Kevin McCuller hurt and everything like that. But now, with how bad the defense got blended up in this game, now you're going to start adding in, you know, defending the pick and roll, defending in space. That becomes important here for Kansas. And I don't know what the offseason plan is going to be like. Is Hunter Dickinson coming back? Is he not? There's, there's questions around, like same with like Johnny Furphy and, you know, all these guys that they have questions to answer about. Are they coming back? Are they not? Are they going to be shown the door? Are they not? Are they going to go pro? Are they not? All right. Those are all real questions. But I definitely, I don't know. There, there's part of me that thinks that if, if you lose Hunter Dickinson, does that allow you to become a really good defense again? Because you can be, um, you you don't have this big weakness in defending pick and rolls if you're playing like KJ and Flory Badunga at the five specifically, right? Like maybe that's a little bit better there. But if you do bring him back, then all of a sudden you are maybe changing up what types of players you're going for. And so I think that becomes interesting because if you are bringing back, you know, Hunter Dickinson, I think you're more so looking in the transfer portal now, can we have guys who are who are dogs on the defensive end? And that becomes really hard if you're like, hey, we need shot creation and shot making and good guys who are really good on the defensive end. Because then you're basically saying, oh, we need just players who are elite at everything. And yes, there are always good players in the transfer portal. But are you going to get like all American level players from everybody you bring in? No, you're not. So um, I don't know. It, it becomes very interesting in how this approaches the offseason, because to a certain standpoint, it, it does feel like okay, went into the, uh, we're going to go into the off season. Like this was the main focus. Now this other thing comes up and it's like, oh, you just have to fix like everything, you know, that's not a great place to be in. So uh, in the end, this is one of the worst seasons and one of the most disappointing seasons of the Bill Self era. And full know that when I say that it is worth a reminder that if a four seed and an NCAA tournament win and making it to the second round, is one of the worst seasons that we've seen in almost 25 years that you absolutely have something special overall. Like you look at Nebraska, they've never won a tournament game and stuff like that. And, you know, you're super lucky to be a part of that and to root for a team that that has been the case. But I guess this year you don't feel like either of those things are true, even though overall that is the case. So, you know, on one hand, it is a bit discouraging that since, um, 2018-19 so since that season began so really since 2019 with the NCAA tournament that year Kansas has only made one second weekend since 2019 
obviously that comes with a bit of asterisks in there. No tournament in 2020. Uh, you won a national title in 2022. But certainly there is not the sustained, like flip it to Gonzaga, for instance. They've made nine straight Sweet 16s, right? Like they've had the sustained second weekend appearances, though they don't have the title that they're searching for. But, um, you know, with Kansas, that hasn't as much been the case. It has been uh, a bit more up and down with, with some of that stuff. The good news is the last two times that Kansas got housed in the first round or in the second round, excuse me, of the NCAA tournament. 2019, you get lose big to Auburn. 2021, you lose big to USC. The next seasons in both of those cases – they had, in the case of 2020, the best team in the country. And in the case of 2022, you won a national title. This one has way more roster holes and roster construction questions than either of those two teams had. So I don't think you can just guarantee and chalk it up and say that, oh, well, look, there's the path. Like, just bring everybody back. You're going to be fine. Look what those two teams did. There are way more questions and holes than those two teams did. But I think the track record and the success of Bill Self – should give them the benefit of the doubt that they'll get this turned around because it still is Kansas basketball. And certainly a disappointing season um, is going to lead to extra motivation in the off season. All right. That'll bring us to our goats of the game and also KU women's basketball got a big tournament win earlier today. So we'll discuss both of those things coming up on locked on Jayhawks. This episode is brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that winter bush with Manscaped Lawn Mowers 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code Locked On for 20% off plus free shipping. Hey, making a mess? Not to worry. This bad boy is waterproof. Shave in the shower, in the bath, or in the ocean. Whether you're looking to craft your signature look or clean up that neckline, these are always the right tools for the job. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. That is 20% off and free shipping with code locked on at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. This episode of the show is also brought to you by Game Time. Buying tickets to your favorite sporting event should not be stressful. Game Time is a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all your sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. Might need to go see a, a comedic act or, or a musical act or something to scrub this one from your brain. You can get those on Game Time. They have killer deals on last minute tickets, and their best price guarantee means you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you're going to be having. You need something fun in your life after what just happened. Use game time for it. They have their flash deals, last minute tickets. You can see the picture, the image view of where your seats are going to be in the arena. So you know if you're getting good seats or if you don't love the view from a certain seat. You can know that with game time ahead of time. No surprises. Snag the tickets without the stress of game time. Download the game time app. Create an account and use code locked on for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code locked on for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. To our goats of the game, let's start with the good goats. I thought Dewan Harris had a really good game. Shots weren't falling for him. Floaters weren't falling for him, especially in the second half. But um, shots weren't falling for anybody for Kansas in the second half. So I guess maybe that gets held against you a little bit less still. Dewan ended up with a double-double, 10 points, 11 assists, and only three turnovers. So 11 to 3, good ratio there. He had four rebounds. He also had a steal. And he was really picking apart the Gonzaga defense, but unfortunately KU missed a lot of layups in the second half and the defense Colton held, couldn't hold up their end of the bargain at the other end. But Dewan was kind of the one guy who his matchup did not go off. So the, the other four starters, Ryan Nemhard is the Gonzaga point guard that Dewan was on. The four starters not named Ryan Nemhard when a combined 28 of 39 or 72% from the floor. So every starter went off for Gonzaga except Ryan Nemhard, who went just one of six for the game, and that was Dewan's guy on him. He scored just five points. Yes, Nemhard did have 12 assists, but he also had five turnovers, and also like those assists aren't all on Dewan. You know what I mean? It's not like like that's on other people letting their guy get open. You know what I mean? That, so I thought Dewan actually had a good game, uh, very good enough for you to win. I thought this would be the player matchup of the game, Dewan on Nemhard, and Dewan was the better point guard in this game. But unfortunately, you didn't have many other things that were better for your way. Uh, Johnny Furphy in the first half gets a good goat here. Nine points in the first half on three of five shooting, four rebounds. He had two threes. He had the and one. He was active. He was hitting shots. And then the second half happened, which we'll get to uh, coming up here in a second. Also, Hunter Dickinson's offense in the first half. Very specific here. Hunter Dickinson's offense in the first half. In the first half, offensively, he had 13 points on five of eight shooting, four rebounds, and four assists. That is unbelievable production for Hunter Dickinson. 
Um, we'll get into the other side of it here in a second. For what it's worth with KJ Adams and Nick Timberlake, I didn't put them in the good or the bad. I thought both would be just like fine. Like neither had great games, neither had like horrible games, and they're both roll pieces, so they were both fine. Like Timberlake gave you a couple threes. Uh, KJ had a couple fun dunks, not his best defensive game, but you know they were both kind of just in the fine column. To the bad goats, though, Hunter Dickinson, the rest. So we gave Hunter Dickinson's offense in the first half a good goat. Unfortunately, second half offense for Hunter Dickinson went as follows. Two points on one of seven shooting with a couple missed bunnies and layups, one rebound, and zero assists. That is rough. And then for the entirety of the game, the defense was really bad. And then once they got down like 10, 12 points, it just maybe this didn't even feel like just a hunter thing. This felt like a lot of other guys. You saw this in the Houston game. Kind of felt like the effort level, the energy level really sunk to a low. And I get it. That's hard. You get down big. You're you're tired as a team. You're a thin roster. It's hard to get back up, but that's kind of your job in these moments. And it just felt like there was too many times, especially down the, the back half of the season for KU, where there was like a little bit of a level. Of, I, I don't want to use the Q word, but I for lack of a better term, there was a little bit too much quit in Kansas when they did get down in games, you know, 10, 12 points that uh, like last year's team. Think about how many times they came back from 10, 12, 15 points, you know, and even if it wasn't, you were going to win the game. Like you want to go out with a little bit more fight than this. Um, but yeah, that, that was not great. So uh, honestly, in the first half, though, it was funny because Hunter was was like the best offensive player on the court. He might have been the worst defense player on the court. It was still a, a net positive for Kansas because I guess, A, they were winning, but also the difference between him and the backup center was enough. But then in the second half, when you're going one of seven from the floor with only one rebound and the bad defense is continuing, you're just not really getting anything there. Uh, Johnny Furphy, great first half, second half, not so much. Furphy's second half ends up on the bad goats here. Zero points on 0 of 7 in the second half. And like the, the biggest indication to me, and this is kind of what I've said, uh, things that he needs to develop, whether this is him developing it when he goes off to the NBA, whether it's him developing it in the offseason, coming back to KU, whatever it ends up being. The biggest thing I'm looking at here for Furphy, I guess, besides, you know, the defensive side is getting more that he can do on the ball, getting more creation he can do, or at least can he have a straight line drive? Can he blow by someone? There was a possession that I noticed where uh, Graham E.K., the six foot nine, like 250-pound big man for Gonzaga, who is not known as a good defender in space, got matched up with Furphy, got switched on to one-on-one, -on -one, and Furphy tried to dribble by him, and he wasn't able to get by him. Like That, to me, shows you the, the parts that still need to grow in his game. And again, will those parts be needed to grow when he's in the NBA next year? Will it be at Kansas next year? Who knows? We'll wait and see on, on that big decision. For my money, that's the biggest offseason decision for Kansas because I think that's the one that you almost want back the most because – even though Furphy had his ups and downs, he was still a freshman and you see the potential with a guy that athletic and that good in transition and shooting the three ball that like, I think Furphy could be a, an all American big 12 player of the year candidate if he comes back next year for Kansas, but who knows? He might also be a first round draft pick. So decisions for him to come uh, the bench for Kansas gets a bad goat here. Uh, Marco Jackson did finish with seven points and uh, like two assists on three of six shooting. So like that actually looks like good production, but that was when the game was already over. Like when the game was on the line, when the game was actually a game, a lot of bad plays and didn't really give you much. I don't know what you do here now uh, for Kansas with, with El Marco Jackson. I lean toward if I was Bill Self, as I was Kansas, I would want the kid back. I, I would want the kid back. He's so athletic. Seems like a great kid. Seems like a nice kid develop him. I mean, he only played three years of organized basketball before this. There's no reason he can't have a high ceiling. Certainly this year though, it was bad enough to make you think like, We've seen Bill Self show guys the door and be like, hey, you're not really going to play much next year. And maybe from his standpoint, he's going, hey, we're going to bring in a combo guard in the portal. And we've got, you know, this this McDonald's All-American freshman coming in who's a combo guard as well in LeBaron Phylon. Like, I don't know how much you're going to play next year. Maybe you should go somewhere else. I don't know. Maybe that's a conversation. But like the way I look at it, Bill Self has done so much better with returning guys, returning talent, developed talent than he has new players coming into the system. I would rather bring back El Marco and try to see what he can develop into because I, I still do believe the long-term potential is there for El Marco, but uh, did not leave you with a, a huge high to finish out the season, I guess I would say. Parker Brown uh, off the bench had five points, two rebounds, also fine production, but uh, that 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 first half minutes that he was in was a real struggle for KU. Um you know, getting lost on the defensive end of the court and not giving the same offense you had with Hunter. And he did his job serviceably this year and what he was asked to do. I definitely thought that Kansas should have played KJ the backup five minutes if they could have. But then again, with Kevin McCuller out, you're kind of running out of options. And honestly, 
it's not even worth the discussion now at this point. You lost by 21 points. Even if you would have made up three or four points on the margin, it wouldn't have mattered. Um, not much from McDowell either in limited minutes either. So just the bench, which was kind of a continued thing this year for Kansas. And then the last one here is, I don't know if I, I put him on uh, either of these all season long. Bill Self. So I, I thought it was interesting that, and let me preclude this. Bill Self is the best coach in college basketball, okay? Um, it does not preclude someone from having a good or bad performance, right? Like you could be the best singer in the world and you could go out there and all of a sudden you just forget the lyrics to your song and you have one bad performance that doesn't make you a bad singer. He's the best coach in college basketball. But I definitely thought it was weird that you didn't get the in-game adjustment in the second half of like, why not try zone? And it's not like, I know Bill Self does not like zone. Like he's made that very clear, but we've seen him go to it in games. It doesn't happen that often, but like I, I mainly think about it happening. Like it felt like it would happen a lot. Uh, when Kansas would play Kansas State when Bruce Weber was there, it was like once every second half when they played in Manhattan, every time they played, they'd like throw out a zone and then Bruce Weber would be like, what is this? You know, I thought it was worth at least a try. You're getting shredded in man to man. You're getting shredded in pick and roll. Switch something up like Gonzaga. Yes, they shoot threes pretty efficiently, but they're a low volume three point shooting team. I think trying zone. I mean, what's the worst that could have happened? You would have given up a bunch of open shots. Well, guess what? You already did. So I don't know. I didn't totally get that. Also. Um, Bill Self is the one who recruited this roster, right? Um, Bill Self is the one who decided that, hey, we could have added another player or two uh, with the scholarship situation. I know you were down in scholarships because the NCAA stuff, but they decided to say, hey, we're going to lose all these scholarships in this year as opposed to being like we're going to spread it out one over one. You're the one who decided to bring in Arterio Morris with the, the shady background that happened there and – the opportunity cost there was instead of bringing in a different player, say a Jalen Tyson, who's now projected to be like a first round draft pick or a Harrison Ingram or some of these other guys, like how would that have been different if you just recruited one of those guys? Right. So he's the best coach in college basketball. I have full confidence that he'll get it figured out, but uh, this was not, I think his best performance or his uh, best year, I guess I would say overall for KU. All right, let's finish up KU women's basketball on a high note advances in the NCAA tournament. Fire TV is your destination for sports from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. Whether it's opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournament, you're going to want to have a Fire TV. Fire TV recently created Fire TV channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free. That includes all of us right here with the Locked On Network and most of the big pro leagues and college conferences as well. Fire TV channels lets you dive into all the game analysis, highlights, and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports. March Madness, NBA, MLB, and lots more. Not to mention great news, entertainment, gaming, travel, cooking videos as well. Check out Fire TV channels on Fire TV and Alexa devices. If you haven't checked out Fire TV channels, you should. To learn more, visit www.amazon.com slash locked on fire tv kansas women's basketball is moving on in the ncaa tournament we'll get to that in just a second i did want to briefly mention for the offseason um there are the biggest questions will hunter dickinson come back will kj I, i'm assuming kj adams is going to come back but i've seen a lot of people being like well you can't play kj next to hunter i agree with that i would just roll with kj and flory badunga at the five um, and then if it's you're playing a traditional big, you play Flory more that game. If not, you have more switchable defense and, and stuff like that. But yeah, will Johnny Furphy come back and which of their backups? It's basically every year is is every player's on a one year contract. So I feel like the one certainty we know for next year's team is Dewan Harris will be back for uh, Kansas. That's kind of one thing. So anyway, KU women's basketball wins 81 to 72 in overtime as the eight seed. They take down nine seed Michigan and the Wolverines. It was a great comeback by KU. They got down late in the fourth quarter down by like six points at, at one point as I was kind of watching back and forth. And then they're down three with like 20 seconds left. Zakaya Franklin in an excellent game, shoots a three, hits off the like front of the rim, bounces off the backboard and in. So it goes in, they tie the score. They make a stop at the end of the game on the last shot of regulation. And then they dominate overtime. Um, 81 or uh, 14 to five in the overtime period for KU women's basketball. So their second tournament win in three years. And really impressive stuff from where they were about two months ago to where they are now moving on to the second round. Uh, as of recording, it looks like they're going to be playing, you know, USC, who's the one seed there. Should be a really fun freshman matchup with 
uh, you know, what, what the two teams kind of bring out with their star freshmen. But uh, really cool to see KU be able to get it done. I do think they're better suited to try to pull that second round upset over the one seed than they were maybe two years ago when they played Stanford in the second round. It's, it's, they're still going to be underdogs. It'll still be a very tough challenge to do, but I do think they're better suited to do that. So we'll see if they can make it further than the men's team. Their game will, next will be on Monday. We'll have uh, plenty of content about the offseason. We'll start getting into some early transfer portal targets for KU basketball. We'll, we'll get into some spring football, more on KU women's basketball, all that coming. So make sure you're still tuning into our episodes. Thank you to the everydayers tuning into each and every show. Find our podcast anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page. And we'll see you next time with Locked on Jayhawks.